by the estate of Sperry H. Goodman. Tonight, something never before seen on television, a show about sex, about sex, about sex. Well, I mean, the, the science of sex. Like, we'll ask the question, why is there sex? Why is there sex? No, I mean, I mean, seriously, why don't we just split ourselves in half like a bacterium, like a bacterium, like a bacterium? Wouldn't that be a lot easier? Why do we have sex? Reproduction. I think it's to bond with other people and create babies. To relieve tension and to uh, share love. Well, it feels good. I think that we have sex because we want to make babies and because we like the way it feels. Because we have a biological urge to procreate. Whoa. It's biologically programmed into every human being. All right, well, if you're going to be scientific about it. <laughs> <laughs> sex is a lot more work than just dividing and reproducing asexually. It takes a lot of time to produce special sex cells like sperm and eggs. And it's expensive in terms of energy. Finding, selecting, and wooing a mate takes even more time and more energy. So if our goal is to pass our genes to the next generation, why do we take such a hard road? Welcome back to America's favorite fun show, Repro Fever. Here's your host, Snap. Thank you very much, Kelly, and welcome back to Repro Fever, the show where two species compete to see how fast they can reproduce. Today's contestants are Dave Horton from Akron, Ohio, and E. coli bacteria. How you doing, Dave? Great, Snap. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Dave is playing for a new car! E. coli is playing for a pile of unrefrigerated ground beef. It's been 24 hours since the start of the game. Let's see how our contestants are doing. E. coli has gone from one bacterium, wow, to 8,300,084. How about that? Wow. How are you doing, Dave? How many times have... You reproduced. Well, not yet, uh, Snap, but uh -huh. I got a date with a girl on Friday, and I'm uh, borrowing my brother's Camaro. That's a nice sled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, might, you know, bring her some roses or flower or something right. at, the, at the beginning of the date. And I, I feel like, uh, feel like my, um, my chances are good. I think I'm in there. I'm in the running. Judges? Well, once again, E. coli is our returning champion with 8,300,084. Wow. But remember, those bacteria are almost genetically identical. It's genetic variation and diversity. That's what you get with sex. Tall people, short people, curly hair, straight hair, brunette, black, blonde. Sex is what makes the world such an interesting place. But what if the underlying reason that so many living things choose the hard way, sex, over the easy way is just to keep one step ahead of parasites. Because of parasites? Because of germs. Oh my god. Is that that's a scientific principle of some sort? I think that falls with what I learned in biology. I don't know if it's something people are conscious of. Mm -hmm. They say, let's go and do it because we have to keep up with the parasites. I don't know. It seems pretty confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever meet someone and it just clicks? You have good chemistry and you're thinking maybe it's their looks or their sense of humor or maybe you're thinking it's a compatible immune system, one that'll give your offspring parasite-resistant genes. <laughs> yeah, me too. Living things and the parasites that attack them have evolved together. We're all in a race and this race takes place on the level of genes. See, parasites like germs are reproducing fast and mutating. 
Through sexual reproduction, plants and animals come up with new and different genetic combinations, and that helps keep the parasites at bay. You stay out. My mama told me not to talk to parasites. I used to be able to get in here. Yeah, but this is a sexually reproducing household, and the locks have been changed. Oh, come on, baby. You know, it's only a matter of time. I can change. Seriously, I will change. You listen, Laos. You'll keep changing, but we'll keep having sex here, so the locks will keep changing, too. Well, can I just use the bathroom? No. Phone? No. I'll buy a cup of sugar? Goodbye. That unwieldy and perhaps poorly acted vignette with the locks, the keys, the human, and the parasite in the suit describes the immune system. Now, it may be the reason we have sex. See, through sexual reproduction, you get genes from your mother and genes from your father. Now, they combine to give you a unique immune system, a new set of locks, if you will, that help you fight off germs and parasites. Now, this line of reasoning has been called the theory of the Red Queen. Now, the Red Queen is somebody that Alice of Alice in Wonderland encounters in the other book through the looking glass. Now, everywhere this Red Queen goes, the whole world moves with her. So Alice has to run like crazy just to keep up. If she stops, she ends up out of this world. And that's the way it goes in our world, too. Moving along doesn't necessarily get you ahead. In fact, we have to keep working all the time just to stay in the same place. <laughs> Alive. <laughs> just a gag. Here, treadmill. Recent research at the University of Chicago showed that women can detect genetic differences through scent. Differences in a single gene that's associated with a man's immune system. The women in the study preferred the sense of men whose immune system genes were similar to their own, but somewhat different, perhaps different enough to ensure a dash of diversity. What we did was we uh, got six people here in Chicago, six men, that were of completely different ethnic backgrounds. They were Ashkenazi Jew, Indian Sikh, Scottish, Swiss, as different and complex a background as you could. And we tested to find out what the genes were of those donors. So we had this box here like this. this precision instrument. This precision instrument here. We had t-shirts that men had worn for uh, two nights in a row. And we gave the women the box to smell, and we gave them two at a time. And then the women are picking a smell that they prefer. If they had to smell it all the time, right. this is the one they'd want. Right. And so what we found was that in all but three cases, the women ranked more highly. They preferred, they chose scents from men who had genes that matched some of their own. So what did you infer from this study? So what we got was, number one, humans' olfactory ability is exquisite. They could pick up differences in the gene products of just one or two genes among millions of molecules. And the only thing we got was that they actually did have a preference, mm -hmm. and it wasn't for the most different. It suggests that the optimum is an intermediate level of matches. And, and the match we're talking about is the immune system. That's right. That is astonishing, that a woman is inferring something about a guy's immune system without knowing it, right? And what's even more astonishing is she didn't know this was a guy. They did not. We asked them, what do you think the odor is? And very few of them thought it had anything to do with humans. It was a closet. Hey, it was a closet. It was a uh, church. It was Walmart. It was cardboard. It was mint. It was fresh baked bread. It was, you know, all different kinds of things is what they smelled like. What's interesting is the genes women matched were the genes they got from their father. I know it sounds Freudian, but it's actually more Darwinian. They're really matching to self, to themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's the part of themselves they inherited from their dads. Mm -hmm. And this is the first evidence of demonstrating the genetic basis for a human choice. If this is involved with 
mate selection. It suggests that this would be a way of selecting the optimum that's a balance of totally matching versus totally different. Because you're alive, you're an adult, you're at a stage, your reproductive stage, you know your combination of genes has worked in the environment you're in pretty well. And so you don't want to stray too far from a very good combination. Inherited choice with a genetic basis mm -hmm. has to do with the immune system. That's right. And it has to do with the mixture of genes that you got, that you're a result of your parents. That's right. <laughs> You see, Mary and Tommy, in evolution, the things that fit in the best survive and have offspring. Mr. Sanders, does that mean my parents are the best because they survived and had me? No, Tommy, I've met your parents, and I'm guessing that had more to do with some type of cheap alcoholic beverage. But, Mr. Sanders, what about the things that don't fit in? Those things often die in horrifyingly bloody encounters with their predators as they shriek for help in their little animal voices. Uh, gee, that doesn't sound fair. Perhaps not, Tommy, but that's not your problem, is it? That's evolution. As the saying goes, nature has her bad designs eaten by her good ones. You've probably heard of natural selection, survival of the fittest. It's the cornerstone of evolution. So for example, polar bears are descendant from brown bears. So the first bear that had a genetic mutation that made his fur appear white had an advantage when hunting seals. So he could pass that gene on to the next generation. So it's survival of the best suited of the ones that fit in the best. Survival of the fittest. This is natural selection. But there's also sexual selection. So you not only have to survive in your environment, you have to compete with other members of your own species for the opportunity to pass genes on. You don't have to be the fastest gazelle. You just have to be faster than the slowest gazelle. <laughs> so sex is at the heart of the evolutionary process. But let's face it. It's led to what appear to be some pretty strange behaviors and some pretty interesting looks. Sexual selection is responsible for those characters that seem like they wouldn't be very helpful, but at the same time are really necessary. Ornamental traits, the things that seem like they're just beautiful, but useless, like the tail on the peacock. But yet, how could they be there without serving some function? Well, we think that what they do is attract females who then prefer those elaborate traits over other males that have less elaborated forms of the traits. So female choice is what's produced the ornamental characters, as opposed to male competition that's produced a lot of the weapon. It turns out that the most important genes for males to show they have, and the most important genes for females to confer to their offspring, are genes that make you resistant to parasites and pathogens. Parasites like these. We got yeah. The reason you have sex is to stay ahead of these parasites. The reason you have sex in the first place is to produce offspring that are going to be able to stay ahead of the of, uh, parasites. But then once you're having sex, the most important thing you can find in a mate is a mate that's going to be resistant to disease. You can see how sexual selection works in the species just by looking. Take that peacock's tail. If it looks scruffy, it might be parasite-ridden, one to be avoided. The more eye spots a male has, the more likely it is that his offspring are going to be able to survive. So it's not just that he's pretty. It's not just that his offspring are going to be pretty, too. It's that his chicks are going to be better able to find food and fight off predators and things like that. Sexually selected flamboyant or ornamental traits often mean that a male is only offering his DNA, not a child rearing partner. That kind of mating system is quite common among animals where males will potentially mate with lots of females. Females will choose a male to mate with. They'll be real picky about which male they mate with. And then after the mating's over, they go off and that's it. When males and females look a lot alike, 
both sexes are being picky. Ornamentation works both ways. The teeny monkeys are a good example of how even male mammals, even male primates, can be good husbands and fathers. So it's not like it's just natural for males to want to cheat on their mates or not want to take care of their babies. Instead, both sexes are looking for a healthy mate, one who invests time and energy into the survival of their offspring. But it's important for both the males and the females to choose a mate that's going to be healthy, that's going to be able to work hard, and that's going to be able to help rear the offspring. Nature has its exceptions, of course. Just look at the seahorse. Seahorses are what we sometimes call sex role reversed, which means that instead of the males being aggressive and competing for the females, the females are aggressive and compete for the males. And they do that in seahorses because in seahorses, unlike most other animals, the males actually are the ones that get pregnant. So the males carry on the eggs until they hatch, and then the babies are born from the males. What all this shows is that these animals are basically doing the same thing. They're reproducing sexually, passing on their own genes, and they're having sexual offspring, which will promote genetic diversity in the future. So how much effort, how much work do you put into sex? 100%. Well, I think you should put a lot into it because it's important. Probably not enough at some times, too much at others. Half of your time? Yeah. It's a lot of time. It is a lot of time. Is it worth it? No, it hasn't paid off. Like 60 or 70%, I think. <laughs> so how much effort do you put into sex, sir? Not very much. Not Cheap was most of the effort in. <laughs> We all expend a lot of energy attracting the opposite sex. Hey, uh, I'll get this. And that can be good, but it can also be bad because it can attract predators or parasites. Oh, great. My wallet's gone. Oh, that's fine. At least I didn't get attacked by some parasitoid fly that laid a larva inside me and then ate my guts from the inside out. <sighs> So this is sexual selection in crickets. Sex, although it has some benefits, also has some costs. Because the exact same signal that makes um, an individual conspicuous to a potential mate can also make him conspicuous to unwanted observers. In the case of these crickets, that's a particularly risky business because when the cricket calls, he, of course, can attract a female, but he also runs the risk of attracting a parasitoid fly. And this fly is attracted to the exact same call that the male uses to attract a mate. The fly deposits larvae around the male. They burrow inside of his body cavity, grow to be the same size he is from the inside. Yikes. Sort of eating him from the inside out. And that's bad. And uh, that's really bad for the cricket because eventually they burst out of the cricket and pupate and become adult flies. From the point of view of the cricket, his life is over. So it's really bad to attract a fly, but the only way to attract a mate is to do the exact thing that will attract this fly. So you're saying that uh, crickets are like us in this one little way, sex has a cost. Absolutely, and like all other animals too. But the price of not having sex is you don't pass your genes on and you disappear from the cladogram of life which from an evolutionary perspective is worse than dying. So some crickets get eaten from the inside out. It's harsh. So harsh you might be saying, Bill, Nye, science guy, what does that have to do with me or with us, humans? Well, everything, everything, everything. You see, you don't get something for nothing in nature. Sexual reproduction costs us big time. Now, while we're staying ahead of parasites, there are, of course, parasites exploiting our desire to stay ahead of parasites. Talking about sexually transmitted diseases, things like herpes, syphilis, HIV. These are old. The ancestors of these diseases have been around since before humans were humans. And then there's the, it's not you, it's me. 
and the, you know, this isn't working. I don't think we should see each other anymore from someone who just rips your heart right out of your chest because she doesn't understand, but I digress. Sex is risky. Well, you know where I'm going with this. The L word, love. And you're saying, Bill, now you're way out of your depth. Science is not love. Oh, yeah? Well, let's take a look at the biochemistry of love. This is your brain. This is your brain on love. It starts with attraction, right here in your hypothalamus. It produces sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. It drives your sex drive. Now, for romantic love, dopamine is the key. It gives you that giddy feeling, that spring in your step, that floaty feeling like you're walking on air. It's the same chemical your brain releases in response to nicotine or cocaine. Now, you know when you see that special someone and you feel that rush, that surge, that burst of energy that starts your heart pounding and your pores sweating? Well, that's the adrenaline talking, getting you ready for a romance. But when you're making a commitment, it's this part of the brain that's active. It's creating vasopressin and oxytocin, the chemicals involved in forming long-term attachment. Now, through the ages, many of us believe love comes from the heart. But scientists are discovering it's really all in your head. And you're saying, Bill, these are just chemicals. They're not why I fall in love. I'm in control here. I make my own decisions. But what if I told you that the person to whom you're attracted and how you pursue that person is the result of nothing more than your evolutionary drive to stay ahead of parasites? You'd be saying, hey, you're pushing this argument too far. Well, do you think we just happen to have those chemicals in our brains and we just happen to find a good use for them? Take a look at these plants. Do you think they make these flowers for fun? Because they want to? Because they're artists? No, they make the flowers to attract pollinators, to sexually reproduce, so they can pass their genes on without getting struck down by parasites like aphids, mites, or thrips. Think about what we do, our behavior. Every time we drive up in a fancy car, put on a little lipstick, dress to impress, splash on a little perfume or a cologne, hit the gym, or take someone out for a nice dinner, we're showing off our plumage our big healthy tails. We're doing the mating dance. But this means that not only is your size, shape, and intellect controlled by evolution, but so is your behavior. And even your feelings are the result of evolution. It's spooky. You think you're in control, but maybe you're not. Not completely. So what? Suppose all this is true. Is it going to change the world? Well, maybe not, but it is fascinating. And it could be that by pondering this question, it indicates a thoughtful, even a smart guy. And I hear that chicks dig that. <clears throat> well, I'll see you next time on The Eyes of Nine. How much for one of these babies, anyway? Oh, that is nice. We've covered a lot of ground, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. Check out eyesofnigh.org for more cool science.
Major funding for the Eyes of Nye was provided by the National Science Foundation.